The Room in Between by Francis Rosenfeld Part 1 Chapter 1 Sunlight The room was large and not brightly lit, a feature that had obviously been designed to create a relaxing ambience and induce a meditative state. Its calming features worked in concert with the soft Muzak tunes and the cozy leather chairs, whose generous width and soft cushions cradled the body into a state close to sleep. On the back wall there was a bar with underlit glass shelving and strange-looking bubbly bottles in unusual shapes and colors. They were all filled with liquids that looked better suited for a chemistry lab than for cocktail ingredients. The dark wood of the bar was topped with a bright white marble slab, streaked with deep green and bluish veins. Oriental carpets, which looked a little worn but definitely expensive, covered every inch of the floor, overlapping in places, so there was no telling what kind of flooring lay underneath. Here and there, on dark wooden side tables, generic ambient lights, elegant but subdued, cast a gentle glow. The walls were the only element in the room that seemed designed to draw attention. They were covered in intricate wooden inlay panels, not dark like the furniture, but in a range of warm golden oak hues, no two designs the same and with no discernible theme, exotic blossoms and twirling vines, geometric motifs, circular labyrinths, grids and landscapes, trompe l'oeils, flower garlands and abstract art. The entire wall was lit from the floor with wall washers, the way they illuminate important buildings and monuments at night and with the same eerie effect. High up close to the ceiling where the light of the floor lights was fading, the motif seemed to come alive in the flicker of the buzzing bulbs, in an illusory motion so distracting that one would forego even the slightest curiosity about what lay above. He couldn't remember how he got there. He just knew he'd been in this room before, more than once, judging by the familiarity he had with its features. Without hesitating, he downed the oily turquoise cocktail in one gulp, ignoring the fact that it gleamed in the low light like it was radioactive, he placed the glass on the side table next to his chair, got up and went straight to the wall on his left. He took a few minutes to pick one of the design patterns and pressed his hand against it. A perfectly concealed door in the wood paneling creaked open and a burst of cold air rushed in, carrying with it the scent of barren leaves, mushrooms, and rain. He shuddered, displeased by the bone-chilling ghostly breath, and took his hand off the panel, which slammed shut, revealing no trace of where the door used to be. He sighed, dejected, poured himself another drink, a weird bright pink concoction this time, picked another chair close to the newspaper stand and smiled in anticipation of a half hour of enjoyable reading. He didn't reach the chair before the light levels in the room dimmed so much that they made reading impossible, so he threw the newspaper back in the stand, frowned at the lights that were continuing to dim and walked towards the other wall, irritated. His hand had barely touched one of the patterns, one which he hadn't actually had time to choose, when the lights dimmed all the way down and the room was engulfed in inky darkness. The familiar creaking, accompanied by an enticing coffee scent, marked his path through the void clearly, even in the dark. He cussed under his breath at the absurd choice in front of him, very much like that of Adam choosing a wife, and walked begrudgingly through the dark opening, a little comforted by the scent of coffee. Honey, his wife raised her voice on her way to the door, without turning around, could you be a dear and pick up a parcel from the delivery locker? I'm so busy today I won't have time to breathe. What parcel? Which locker, he uttered in her wake, confused but loud enough to be heard. I left the note on the kitchen counter. Love you, she replied, consumed with the anticipation of daily events, as she closed the door behind her. He took a moment to figure out where he was, and whether he'd been there before. It only took one quick glance to realize he hadn't. He went for the ultimate test, trying to guess which one of the many cupboards in the large and fancy kitchen was holding the coffee cups, picked one that seemed to him like the best candidate and found it filled with cloth napkins. Darn, he frowned and gave up on the coffee, he grabbed the note from the counter and his face lit up with relief when he saw the name of the city, Juno, Alaska. Earth. Nice, he thought, walking towards the door eager to take in the sights. It was the middle of spring at the height of the morning, but the sunlight hadn't breached the horizon yet, and he walked halfway to the delivery locker, under a pastel color sky dotted by the brightest stars. The northern lights were putting up quite a show. Encouraged by the familiar surroundings, even though he'd never been to Juno before, he charted with ease the simple grid of the streets. It made him feel at home somehow. Random fragments of memories about this place flashed inside his mind for fractions of a second and then dropped back under the surface of consciousness before they had had the time to imprint themselves on his brain, like a dream forgotten in the morning. He took a turn down the main street, and the comforting warmth that was still running through his veins, compliments of the familiar city and the turquoise and pink libations, turned to ice in an instant. Rising above the horizon, 
glorious in its splendor, a ringed sun glowed aqua blue, bedazzled by an unknown number of visible satellites. Not my earth. Let me guess, the parcel contains fire dragon eggs, he commented, bitter, dragging his feet to the delivery locker, drained of hope. The clerk at the front desk was particularly cheerful, chewing gum and talking up a storm into a phone she held flat, like a plate, over the tips of her fingers, to a person one had to guess was her boyfriend, about deeply personal matters that held absolutely no interest for a stranger. She stopped for a second in the middle of the dialogue to acknowledge his presence and greet him with a wonderful weather we're having today, smiled and went back to her conversation. He gestured a question towards her to inquire about the location of the lockers, and she pointed decisively to a corner in the back while still engaged in conversation. The locker was empty. He stepped outside to wait for the daily drop, since he had nothing better to do, and sat on a curb to admire the jewel-toned sun which shone brightly now, and cast a cool hue on everything in his current world. He cherished these little unexpected moments of awe, when the beauty of the universe revealed itself to him like a capricious mistress, these moments that were elusive and ephemeral, and for this very reason so much more worth beholding. What else was one here for if not to see, feel, and understand the mysterious songs of creation? As best one could, anyway. The spring sunshine hadn't had time to melt all the ice, but it carved out deep rivulets crisscrossing each other and creating intricate designs of variable scale endlessly repeating, Mother Nature's template for all the things that move and all the things that live. The Working Diagram of Being A crash of careless footsteps smashed his little painting on ice, leaving the muddy threads of boot soles in its place. Harmony and willpower had clashed right before his eyes, and neither of them won. The mail carrier kept walking all the way to the back of the office, where the lockers were, and started dropping parcels in their black boxes, absent-minded, with gestures that had become automatic after so many years. Oh, look, your parcel is here, the clerk commented, filled with glee as if the parcel contained a wonderful surprise, something special, unexpected, and unique. Who knows, maybe she's right, he thought. I'm sorry, but we have to open it, you know, she smiled apologetically. He nodded in agreement, kind of embarrassed that he had no idea as of the contents of the package and was saddened to hear her say. Ink cartridges, right? Ah, yeah. Yeah. The glory of a Lilliputian ice world had been trampled underfoot and ink cartridges had emerged from its dissolution, like a phoenix from its own ashes. What an absurd simile, he thought, because there was no myth or glory to ink cartridges, was it? On the other hand, who was to say what was more important, or whether anything was important or unimportant? Maybe everything just was, without an assigned usefulness value. You're all set, the clerk dismissed him with the same cheerful attitude, and he had to wonder, what was it that this woman possessed that fed her zest for being, and enticed her to bite into day-to-day -day life like one would into a juicy fruit, and have it dribble its essence all over her hands and cheeks. He took the parcel and went home, not failing to notice that the days in this realm, wherever it was, were unreasonably short, and when he arrived at his residence, he found a frazzled message on the answering machine. His wife had a meeting that was going to run long into the evening, and she wasn't going to make it home for dinner. She mentioned the rice casserole in the freezer and accompanied this detail with an excessive set of instructions on how to use the microwave. He dropped the ink cartridges on the kitchen counter, made himself a sandwich instead, and crashed on the couch. He couldn't tell how long he'd been napping, but he awoke to the soothing sounds of Muzak. Chapter 2. Continuity of course, he mumbled and got up from the leather couch he'd been sleeping on, stretching a little, to straighten his sore back. What is this place? He looked around, somewhat relieved to find himself in a familiar setting. The light levels in the room were low enough that the spotlights under the glass shelves picked up on the luminescent quality of the liquors inside the odd bottles, and made them sparkle with their own inner glow, like they were part of the ambient lighting themselves. He noticed, to his bewilderment, that his stomach was rumbling, he was starving like he hadn't eaten in days. I wonder if they keep any food around here, he started rummaging through the refrigerators underneath the bar in search of plunder. He emerged victorious from his quest through Barkeep Underworld, a sandwich in one hand and a plate in the other. He arranged a place setting for himself on the other side of the counter, and went back for the beer. This is not so bad, he thought, reasonably satisfied, as he threw the last bite of the sandwich in his mouth and washed it down with what was left of the bottle. He got up to get himself another cold one and his good mood turned suddenly sullen, the lights in the room had started to dim. He sighed, annoyed, grabbed a candy bar for the road and approached the wall to pick a pattern. Which pattern to choose? Would it make a difference, one versus another? 
After all, he did not know what the patterns meant anyway, or whether there was a hierarchy to them, some kind of order that helped one make sense of the collection as a whole, rather than as a mismatched kit of parts. He tried to make connections between the flourishes and the geometric designs, a wasted effort really, like trying to find the sharp edges of a rushing stream. He shrugged, thinking what's the point, and picked a pattern at random. The dark passage beaconed from behind the open panel, but it wasn't like the last one, a pitch black hole, it was a shallow space, like the inside of a double wall, whose back was close enough to touch if he stretched out his hand. On this back wall, conveniently placed on a shelf right in front of his face, there was a flashlight. It was lit. You've got to be kidding me, he hesitated, trying to figure out from the air movements if this shallow interstitial space had another opening somewhere along the way. He frowned, on the verge of deciding to let the door snap back shut, mark the pattern as unusable, and try his luck with a better one, but curiosity got the better of him, and he stepped in, almost against his will, to the sound of the panel closing behind him. He immediately regretted his decision, but the panel was now shut and he couldn't see or feel any traces of the opening, so he sighed, grabbed the flashlight, and started walking along the wall. The interstitial space was unfinished, and the gaps between the studs were filled with dust and cobwebs, and electrical wires that gathered in thick bunches here and there, and hung in lazy catenary curves along the girts. Wherever the roof deck was, it was too high to see in the dim glow of the flashlight, and every ten feet or so, the thick bunches of cables took a turn upwards, clambered the double studs like ivy, and disappeared into the darkness above. He had been walking through the narrow space for he didn't even know how long, having to turn sideways from time to time, to clear stack vents, and vertical mains, when he noticed that the horizontal framing was morphing, stretching deeper and deeper, and turning to shelves and grates, on which he could see odd objects, covered with dust, a little tin of mouse be gone, a stack of shelf braces, an empty water bottle. The more he advanced, the fuller the shelves became. They were spaced a foot apart now, with the narrow walkway widening to a comfortable four feet, the interstitial space started taking the appearance of a library back room. The weird storage space, filled with stacks of books, all protected in archival cellophane bags and bound all the same, without titles or differentiating features, ended abruptly in front of a large fire door, as wide as the corridor. One could see the space beyond it through the wire glass light, a huge reading room, wrapped in heavy wood cabinetry, and whose gently domed ceiling was adorned with frescoes. Even though the space was barely visible in the soft gleam of the emergency lights, he recognized it immediately. What on earth am I doing here, he thought as he tried the door, just to cover his bases. As expected, it was locked. He turned around to find his way back, and gazed, bewildered, at a square room, large enough not to feel claustrophobic and surrounded by shelves. There was no corridor. Well, he thought, I guess I'll just have to make myself comfortable and wait for the place to open. Somebody was bound to be in that large public reading room during library hours, and they were sure to hear him pounding on the door. While he tried to compose a plausible explanation for how he ended up locked in an archive room during off hours, a trickle of thought, cold as liquid nitrogen, made its way through his mind, and spilled into his whole nervous system, making his hands tingle and his chin go numb, he had been in that public reading area so many times he lost count, and he was absolutely sure he had never noticed a wide metal door in it. There was no doubt in his mind about that. He tried to comfort himself with the fact, that maybe the public side of the door had been cosmetically altered to match the decor, a thought he dismissed, because it made no sense. All the staff doors he remembered seeing in that room were barely 30 inches wide, at most. In a panic, he jumped, and started jiggling the handle, in an irrational attempt that actually panned out, the door opened with no effort. He looked at the other side of it, while still standing in the doorway, and he wasn't even surprised to confirm that it was indeed one of the narrow staff doors, leading to the restricted section. A golden cursive marked the door, J.C. He looked inside again, and found it transformed into a closet, barely two by three, with an old mop sink in one corner, and cleaning supplies stacked neatly in the other. An ironic grin upturned the corners of his lips. The broom closet. Really. The problem with understanding reality is not that we can't see it for what it is, it's that we do, but explain it away, because the findings don't jibe with our mental model of what it is supposed to be. Excuse me, sir, a voice sounded from behind. He turned around to see a woman, whose face betrayed internal conflict, she was still assessing whether she should be nice to the lost library patron, or stern towards the perpetrator, who was trying to breach into a restricted area. What are you doing? Those doors are for staff only. He smiled his most charming smile, but didn't have time to concoct an answer before the lady became belligerent. 
And how did you get in here? The library opened only two minutes ago. He fretted, in search of an answer, while she stopped him with a decisive hand gesture. Stay right here, please. I'm going to call my manager. What is this about? A distinguished older gentleman in a three piece suit approached the two. This person was trying to gain access to a non public area, the lady explained. I actually wasn't, he played for time. I have misplaced my glasses. Oh, there they are, he smiled, and pointed cheerfully at a pair of spectacles that was sitting on top of the partition between the printers. Long night, you know. He smiled apologetically, grabbed the glasses and placed them on his nose, struggling to fit their narrow frame around his face. They were too small. The older librarian frowned in disapproval at the disheveled appearance of the man before him. His clothes were dusty, like he'd been sleeping on the floor, and one could see pieces of cobwebs hanging from one of his sleeves. He shook his head in dismay, and left without a word, thinking how much the mores of polite society had declined, for a patron to show up to request materials from the reference desk, nursing a hangover at eight in the morning. His stride broadened as he approached his office, which he entered, relieved, and locked behind him. His morning research time, respected by all. What am I to do now? The lost wanderer looked around, found himself unrestricted, and used the lucky opportunity to leave. He could hear the woman librarian call out from behind, as he negotiated his way down the monumental marble stairs, amid the sea of people walking up and down it. Hey! Those are my glasses. Stop him. Stop him immediately. Security. He abandoned the glasses on the flat cap of a stair post, and got lost in the crowd, to make his way out into the park. Who am I? He groaned, anguished. Who am I? Why do I know this place? How am I ever going to get back home, when I don't know where that is? He reached into his pocket and pulled out the candy bar and a bunch of dollar bills, all crumpled up, and slightly humid. The morning air was humid too, and a cutting wind reached him to the bone, as if to punish him for walking outside without a coat so early in spring. Biting into the candy, he smiled at the dollar bills, swerved left abruptly, and headed towards a tiny coffee shop, in the basement of the building across the street. It took his eyes a few seconds to adjust to the dark, after he'd been out in the bright light of the morning, and only realized where he was, when he heard the soft Muzak tones, after the door had already closed shut behind him. Chapter 3 Framework For a moment, he forgot he was cold and wet, and really could have used the cup of coffee he was looking forward to, and went straight to the panel from the day before, to check if it led to the same place. In all honesty, he held no hope for consistency, and expected to see an unfamiliar sight, so the image of the interstitial wall space with the lit flashlight on the shelf right in front of him caught him by surprise. When one faces chaotic patterns, it's not their strange and aberrant behavior that throws one for a loop. That is to be expected, and bows to logic. It is the consistency of behavior inside the chaos that can drive a person insane, more precisely, the local, provisional consistency of it. One must understand that chaos plays by rules too, just rules we can never postulate, because doing so would inherently contradict their very principles, and which apply only for as long as we expect them not to. The second we're locked into a pattern of behavior, and committed it to mind, it will change. The fact that the unfortunate subject is always caught on the wrong foot by the unpredictable substance of disorder, a characteristic he should learn to expect after a certain number of experiments, is due to the intrinsic limitations of the human mind. We can't function in a world with no organizing principles. The mind is structured, language is structured, the fabric of space is structured, time is structured and directional. One just cannot conceive of the absence of causality. Worried that he might forget which pattern that was, he propped the panel door open with a chair, and ran to the bar to see if he could find anything, a pencil, a marker, something to write with. He wrestled up a piece of chalk, and wrote library on the panel, let the door close, and opened it again to check. The double wall was still there. He figured that was probably not going to last, but left the label on the panel anyway, because it was the only clue he had so far. He checked the panel he had opened the day before, which still led into a pitch black void, but he couldn't tell if it was the same pitch black void from two days ago, or a completely different one, so he shrugged, marked the panel with an X to remind himself that he went through it before, and went back to the bar. He was tired. He was hungry. His body was aching. His clothes were still damp, and he noticed with displeasure that he was in dire need of a bath. 
This is going to be a problem, he thought, deciding to eliminate at least the one variable of the equation, for which he hoped he had a solution. A quick search through the bar area yielded a tub of frozen soup, whose sight made his mouth water, and his body feel warm and comfortable already. There was a wall-mounted microwave on the back of the bar, to heat it up in. At least I won't have to subsist on cold cuts for the rest of my, whatever the heck this is, he mused, waiting for the soup. He remembered the rice casserole from the day before, and had an irrational urge to go back through the panel, and see if there was any of it left, but thought it would probably be gone by now, even if the panel led to the same place. Besides, there was no reason to believe that time kept the same schedule in the world of the blue ringed sun, and he'd probably have to spend time with the wife, which felt most awkward, so he resigned himself to the microwave delicacy that was now ready to eat. He must have arrived back early, he thought as he gulped down the soup, too hungry to worry about it being hot. The lights gave no warning of dying down, so he figured he might have some time to rest, and make himself comfortable, as best one could, under the circumstances. He finished his soup, washed the plate, placed it on the drying rack, wiped the bar clean, and went to explore the back room, inside which he found a few surprises. Even though the establishment didn't look like it would have a need for it, the back room revealed a full commercial kitchen, complete with lockers and showers, and a large washer and dryer for the chef's outfits, which he could see hanging on hooks, not too far from where he was standing. Some of the locker doors were open, and he noticed that someone had left a track suit in one of the lockers. He hesitated for a moment, reluctant to borrow a complete stranger's clothes, but exhaustion and physical discomfort got the better of him. He showered, changed, grateful to feel clean, warm and dry again, dumped his clothes in the washer for a quick spin, and went back into the lounge to read a magazine before it was time to move them to the dryer. This little domestic routine put him in such a good mood, he forgot about his travels and the fact the lights could dim at any moment, with no schedule or warning. He made himself comfortable on a couch, with an old country living magazine, and his head had barely touched the soft cushions before he went out like a light. He woke up disoriented, and stared in disbelief at the weird outfit he was wearing, slowly starting to remember the events of the day before, and surprised the lights were still on. Maybe they come on and off automatically, he figured. Maybe I don't have to leave here for a while. I could definitely use some rest. With that thought, he turned over and went back to sleep. He woke up again a few hours later, to an insane racket of pots, pans, and raised voices in the kitchen, so loud it could raise the dead. It made him jump off the couch in a panic, not knowing what to do, worried that the people in the kitchen, whoever they were, were going to put him to the question for squatting in their workspace. He threw himself at the panel closest to him, and emerged on the other side of it inside a space that was a chiral replica of the one he just left, only without the benefit of company. His legs still shaking from the shock, he tried to compose himself, and walked into the back room, to make sure there was nobody there. He noticed the washer had just finished its cycle, it contained his clothes. Without giving it a second thought, he grabbed them and put them in the dryer, and then went straight to the bar, to fix himself a stiff drink. How many copies of this room were there? It hadn't occurred to him that this room he thought of as the only constant in the game was in fact a collection of identical, and in this case, not exactly identical, copies of itself. Did it matter at all whether the space he was in was the same, as long as it looked and felt the same to him? He rushed to the panel he'd just emerged from, and marked it Muzak Lounge, opened it barely ajar to verify whether it led back to the room with the noisy kitchen, and was met with absolute silence. The rules of chaos hard at work. His head dropped to his chest in a dejected, helpless gesture. He wanted to erase the label from the door, and stopped himself right before he had the epiphany, the labels were not identifiers of unique instances, they were identifier lists for instances, and that charting the lists themselves could yield some useful answers. He also pondered on the fact that having those lists build up to a usable sample would take a lot more days than he wanted to consider, and that even if those lists were populated enough for a proper analysis, the analysis itself still could, and probably would, yield nothing. Still, when you're tasked with sorting out a mountain of beans into shapes and colors, there is no practical benefit in waxing philosophical over the magnitude and futility of the enterprise, if you have no alternative to it. On a whim, he checked the door that said library, and which was now on the opposite side of the room, to see if that was still staying consistent, and breathed a sigh of relief when he glimpsed the flashlight through the door he'd cracked open just an inch. Satisfied with the progress, he checked to see if his clothes were dry, changed back into them, and put the track suit in the wash, to have it clean if future needs arose, poured himself another drink, which he doubled this time, and settled down in a chair to finally read his magazine. It wasn't country living. 
It was the daily newspaper. And it couldn't possibly have been from today, because even if he'd lost track of time with all this nonsense, he was pretty sure that history had advanced far past 1947, he could remember mobile phones and space shuttles. Maybe somebody abandoned this newspaper in the lounge a long time ago, and nobody bothered to throw it away. He got up to check the rest of the periodicals, but there wasn't a single one with a date more recent than 1947. Time slices, he had a revelation. They are not copies. They're time slices of the same continuum. He almost congratulated himself on discovering the unifying law that governed his universe, when reason called him back. But then why would this room be a mirror image of itself? The rules of chaos had struck again. Chapter 4 Wildlife Oh, what's the difference, he uttered morosely, and headed for the panels on the wall, weighing his chances of ending up somewhere nice for a change. He could use a change of decor from the soothing atmosphere of the lounge, which at the time made him feel like he was recovering in a convalescent home. The space behind the panel was completely dark, but the rest of his senses made it very clear he'd found his way to an evergreen forest. There was a strong scent of pine in the night air, and he could feel, even though he couldn't see, the movements of the branches above his head, synchronized with the sound of the wind, and the swaying of the surrounding vegetation. Ferns, he guessed, by the lacy texture that touched his fingers. Now and then, the hooting of an owl creased the silence, followed by an entire symphony of little noises, creatures scurrying through the brush of the forest floor, chattering squirrels hiding in the branches, pine cones, needles falling to the ground, aimless gusts of wind. He felt around himself, and learned that he was sitting on a flat stone, covered in soft pine needles and overgrown by ferns, and other forest plants he couldn't recognize. There was so much peace in this state, in this spirit-filled darkness, that he checked himself to make sure he wasn't dead, because what person feels safe in the forest at night, with no knowledge of what lies beyond the reach of his arms, and no protection from the elements? It seemed, though, that the elements themselves had granted him asylum, him, the unfit human with no knowledge of their workings, the human who nevertheless decided to venture, sight unseen, into their world, and who for some bewildering reason was not afraid of it. A gentle breeze pushed aside the treetops, like drawing a curtain, to reveal the night sky filled with stars. It was only a moment, no more, but long enough to catch the dark contours of a giant creature not ten feet away from him. He panicked, and all the air got knocked out of his lungs, like from a pop balloon. He desperately tried to quiet his heart, which refused to cooperate, while he strained his eyes to glimpse the creature in the darkness, trying to guess its movements. Hours passed in this state of terrified awareness, during which his body followed its own rules, independent of his reason and will, impervious to hunger or cold, a live wire ready to react to the slightest sign of attack. The darkness of the woods turned even deeper, even though that didn't seem possible, right before dawn, and then started fading slowly, into lighter and lighter shades of grey and violet. In the muddled softening of the dark, he watched the figure turn around, with the slow motions of a bear, and vanish into the shadows of the understory before he could make out what it was. The light grew thick after that, revealing the beautiful scenery he had felt, but not seen, a few hours before, the soft black of the slate he was sitting on, the fronds of the ferns. The birds had awoken, and were frolicking in the branches above, noisy, and unseen. He felt exhausted by the emotional turmoil of the night before, wanting nothing but to lie back down on the flat slate, and actually get some sleep, but he worried that the edge of the forest was far away from there, and he won't be able to make his way out into the clear before nightfall. He willed himself to get up, and looked around for any signs that would help him orient himself, moss, anything that looked like a trail, changes in vegetation. He had to admit that his life had never been about communing with nature, which he'd always found threatening and alien, the place civilization saves one from. Discouraged, he picked a random direction, and started walking through a scenery that seemed to move with him, but whose general outlines stayed the same, like the revolving decor of an improvised theater. Hours into this, just when he seriously started to worry that he was running in circles and he would never find his way out, he felt the familiar wet touch, of a dog's snout probe his hand. The dog's owner approached, walking a forest trail that suddenly came into focus in the undifferentiated brush, a stocky old man with bright white hair and a slight limp, who, in that moment, looked to the wary hiker like the most beautiful being in the universe. The old man quickened his stride, to meet the stranger who looked lost, and addressed him, when he got within close enough range, still huffing and puffing from the effort. Enjoying nature sir. A small and slightly ironic smile lifted a corner of his mouth while he stopped to listen to the answer. I kind of was, the traveler had to admit to himself, right up to the point where I had to sleep within ten feet of a bear. 
He didn't say it, though. He smiled politely, and with all the energy he could muster after the stress of the night and the journey through the woods, responded. I'm afraid I am very lost. I've been walking for hours, and I started wondering whether I should ever be able to get out of these woods. Ah, no one is lost in these woods dear sir. The forest is very protective of its charges. It wouldn't let you come to harm. To each his own, he thought, too tired from the journey, and too relieved to have human company, to judge the subject of the conversation, no matter how loony. The guardian keeps watch. The guardian, he asked, exhausted. Of course. The guardian of the forest, the old guy replied, smiling blissfully from ear to ear, like he was talking about a beloved family member. Not everybody can see him, though. He's shy. So, the traveler interjected, becoming impatient, is there any way you could point me in the right direction? Maybe I could walk with you when you go back, he suggested, thinking that wherever the old man was going was bound to be around other people. I could use some company. Nobody comes here anymore, just me and Jasper, he continued, smiling and whistling to the dog to call him back. Is it far, the edge of the forest, the traveler sought reassurance, but the old man ignored him and started talking his ears off, naming every plant they passed by, and drawing his attention to little critters, and rock formations, and streams, and bird calls. What in the world am I doing here? Why am I here? The traveler got caught in a circular wave of tiredness and absurdity, reinforced by the unlikely object lesson, and the expansive enthusiasm of his companion, which manifested in heavy pats on his shoulder and, at one point, an affectionate bear hug. He breathed a giant sigh of relief when he noticed that the vegetation was thinning, and he could discern the lines of a freshly plowed field behind it. He instinctively picked up the pace to reach the edge of the forest, and noticed that the old man was falling behind. His puzzled expression prompted a response from the latter. Well, you be on your merry way now. There's a tavern, half a mile down the road, right at the edge of the town. You aren't coming, he couldn't help his curiosity, slightly embarrassed to question a complete stranger's choices. Not my kind of place I'm afraid, he said, smiling and petting the dog on the head. We belong here, don't we, Jasper? The dog stared at him with tearful eyes, and let out a dull woof in response. The old man turned around, still talking to his pet, like a man who had finished his work and deserved a brief respite. What on earth am I doing here, the traveler continued running along his mental groove, at the same time probing the direction the old man had pointed towards, for any proof of human habitation. There wasn't any, but at least he was out of the woods, and he owed that to the odd stranger. He turned around to thank him again, but the man and his dog were already out of sight. He reached the tavern at sunset, dead tired, hungry, and emotionally spent, and parked himself on a stool at the bar, staring at the beer the barkeep was pouring like it was his last hope for salvation. You're not from around here, the barkeep mumbled under his breath. No. Say, where is here? Black Hawk, North Dakota, he looked at the traveler reproachfully. He'd seen his fair share of lost souls and drifters in his life, but very few who looked so much like city folk. Is there a bus that runs through here, the lost traveler insisted, despite the quiet disapproval. There'll be one in an hour. Take you to Rapid City. You can find your own way from there. A straggly stranger had made himself at home on the bar stool next to his. He was already two beers ahead and in a great mood for chatting. Leave the man alone, Tanner. Don't you see he's tired? He turned to face him directly, uncomfortably close. Been to the forest, have you? Yes, he strained his mind to find something agreeable to say. Very scenic. Have you met the guardian? The stranger leaned in, propping himself up on his third pint, half consumed. What is it with this guardian? Everybody here is simply obsessed with him. He decided to ask out loud. The guardian. Who is that? It's not a who, it's a what, the stranger's eyes gleamed, a little glossy from the alcohol. The spirit of the forest, he whispered. It keeps travelers safe when they get lost in the woods at night. Get out of here, the traveler suppressed a bout of laughter. And here I worried about sleeping next to a bear. This takes the cake. Folks around here say it's boding good luck to meet the guardian, especially for a traveling feller such as yourself. He tried to think of an excuse that would get him away, at least for a short time, from the stranger's animated geniality, so he got up to head for the restroom, which had become a necessity anyway after the second pint of beer. Jasper liked you, I can tell, the stranger yelled in his wake. He always likes the visited. The weary traveler shrugged, 
eager to escape this awkward conversation, and upon opening the bathroom door he was welcomed by the familiar Muzak sounds. Chapter 5 The Third Degree There is no method to this madness, he thought dejected. He couldn't help notice that the room had started to look a little beat up in the aftermath of his dutiful documentation of his journeys. The weird wayfinding scribbles and symbols he had marked up on the paneled walls for later looked basic and childish and made no sense, and he questioned the usefulness of this endeavor. What if, just what if, he made himself at home in this whatever it was, and stopped getting dragged into every crazy that was waiting for him outside? It occurred to him it was possible, at least in theory, that during his normal, underwhelming daily life, he accidentally opened one of these doors through reality, and ended up trapped in an endless loop that always brought him back to the lounge room. He got up from the chair to evaluate his findings, which covered most of the walls now, random clusters of unrelated things, at least to a rational mind. No patterns, no rules. Looks like I defaced perfectly beautiful marquetry paneling for nothing. He sighed and poured himself another drink. I can't even get drunk in here, he looked at the fancy tumbler, then at the almost empty bottle, with a cold still lucidity as hard as glass. Maybe it's non-alcoholic, reason came to offer help, completely out of context, but still welcome, because it brought with it a soft breeze of hope. Like a raindrop in the desert, he thought. Doesn't solve your problem, but it holds you hostage to the promise that an answer exists until too much time has passed for it to matter. Maybe looking for connections was the wrong approach. Maybe the solution to his problem was something completely different, something so banal that it wouldn't cross his mind to notice. I must be really getting desperate. No, seriously, what if I just set up camp in here and never go back out? At least for a while. Can't be worse than getting lost in the forest at night, or ending up in a locked storage room. Somebody had changed the music to sounds he hadn't heard before, and his mindset shifted, drawn to the beautiful marquetry patterns now covered in scribbles. Just like his scribbles, no two of the former were alike. He felt as if he had been parroting those patterns all this time, translating them into a different language, one made of scribbles and symbols as opposed to wood veneer, without understanding them at all. He looked around the room, trying to figure out how to organize it, so it would feel more like home, and less like the waiting room at a train station, scratching his head in frustration that the room didn't seem to lend itself to privacy and comfort. One of the panels opened all by itself. He looked at it, focusing his attention on its details to remember them later, the design comprised swirling and winding stems with tulips at the ends, so entangled, it was impossible to tell them apart. I'm not going, he decided, calm, then turned his back to the gaping hole in the wall, and went to the bar to fix himself lunch. A blood-curdling scream emerged from the depths, the sound of a person facing mortal danger. He hesitated, faithful to his original intent, arguing with himself that this was not his problem and that being stuck in here in this alternate reality hub was punishment enough. Meanwhile, a second scream pierced his ears, and then a third, accompanied by desperate cries for help. His protective instincts got the better of him, and he walked through the opening, already furious because he knew ahead of time he'd have plenty of opportunities to regret this later, kicking himself for being such an idiot, and hating that person, whoever they were, for calling out his guilt. He barely had time to adjust his eyes to the bright sunlight, when he got engulfed in a sea of flashes, camera clicks, and shouted questions. It felt very much like a nightmare, too surreal to be happening, and engendering the same vague feeling that things didn't fit, but in ways one couldn't clearly state, even to oneself, because that part of one's brain that made the logical connections had somehow been disabled. Did someone put drugs in my drink, he went to the next logical possibility, which his sharp mind dismissed as unlikely. What was wrong wasn't with him, it was with everything else. But that's insane. That is literally the textbook definition of madness. Why did you do it, coward, a vicious voice from the crowd attacked him, bringing him back to reality, or whatever this was, with enough time to notice that he was barefoot, and wearing lounge pants and a t-shirt, as if someone had grabbed him straight out of bed. Where is here, and where is the victim, he reasoned that the screamer probably didn't end up well, and they thought him the perpetrator of the crime. Waves of rage swept over him, and he swore on everything he held dear that if he ever got out of this, which was the likely outcome, if past experiences were any reference, he could see a person being slowly disemboweled right in front of his face, ignore them, and go right back to reading his newspaper. His newspaper had never tried to shove a microphone in his face and insult him for no reason, thus his newspaper was better company. 
He felt guilty for worrying about himself instead of putting the tragedy of the unfortunate victim first, and then he felt angry about getting dragged into yet another circus he didn't belong to, and asked to tend its monkeys. Degenerate, another scream emerged, followed by a shoe which barely missed his head. Pervert, another scream followed, drowned in a sea of jeers and protests from a crowd that was approaching menacingly, barely held back by the cordon of police. The officers were giving him dirty looks too, to let him know that the disgust was definitely shared, but that they were obligated by their duty. What the hell did the perpetrator do, he wrecked his mind to imagine, as a tiny helpless smile curled his lips in a silent call for help from anyone who would dare show him kindness. Look at that monster smile, a grunt pushed through the cordon to get in his face, and he read so much hatred in that person's eyes, he knew that if it weren't for the police, he'd already be dead. An endlessly creative series of curses and profanity accompanied the death stare, getting louder as a couple of officers dragged the attacker away from the crowd. I hope you rot in hell for what you did, you depraved demon spawn, a crying woman's grief pierced him like a rusty knife, with an intensity designed to inflict maximum immediate and long-term damage. Why did you do it sir, the press kept pushing through, louder than the crowd so their questions could be heard over the screams of the protesters. Was it for the money? Did you hope to get her money? Did you two have an affair? Did you push her, an interviewer got so close to him he could feel his hot breath in his face. Did you push her? So it was a she, and she must have fallen from somewhere high up, he tried to put the story together in his head, knowing full well that these stories never congealed into something halfway coherent. It was like an orchestra rehearsal before the performance, where every instrument practices its own tough piece to perfect it. Perfected chaos. He tried to turn his head, to see if the scene everybody was raging about was behind him, but an outraged policeman grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and forced his head forward. Time to go sir, he said harshly, and prompted him with a controlled but stern grab of his arm. The pavement felt very cold under his feet, he assumed by the looks of the landscape that it was February. He was definitely not dressed for it, and, despite his best efforts to put a good face on this whole situation, he started shivering uncontrollably. He couldn't help thinking how pitiful it was for a land creature to have gotten so soft that it had to limp to avoid the sharp pokes of the occasional pebbles in order to protect its sensitive souls. A land creature whose feet were too soft for the land it walked on. It would have been comical if it weren't so sad. It was a mistake, a revelation hit his confused mind with the glaring light of the obvious, but he couldn't tell exactly what the mistake was, that he had become incompatible with his own environment, that he got stuck in a reality loop, or this instance of his torment, which didn't even register as a priority in the larger scheme of things. It was a mistake, he kept shouting inside his head, and even there, his shouts kept getting gruff and muffled, until they ended up sounding more like a forced whisper. The crowd kept pushing against him and the group of police officers who were holding their bodies to protect him from it. Somebody still managed to reach his body and grab the collar of his t-shirt. It choked him before it ripped, exposing even more of his skin to the wet chill. The station must be closed, otherwise they would have put me in a car, he tried to pep himself up, but they kept on walking, and after a while he couldn't feel his body anymore, or the rough pavement under his feet. Right this way sir, the officer in command pushed him up the stairs and towards the door of the police station, and more than anything in his life, he prayed to God he would hear Muzak the second that door popped ajar, but sadly that didn't happen. The officer led him to an office, instead of an interviewing room, sat him down in a chair, and left. He waited there for hours, while busy people swarmed around, ignoring him, very involved in what seemed to be a breakthrough in an important case, the one he had gotten himself entangled with, he assumed. He tried to gather from fragments of their conversations what were the details of his guilt, but the information he got was too sparse and disjointed to make sense. He stared intently at his surroundings, trying to take in every detail of the room, unable to chase away the thought, one of those many doors that kept yapping open and closed like angry mouths was his path to freedom. Chapter 6. Strategy. When he opened his eyes, he was welcomed by the familiar sight of the lounge room, and his first thought was how lucky he was to be back home. The mind is a strange thing, that can twist and stretch to no end, and accommodate almost anything, no matter how logically unsound, when caught in the push and pull of rationalizations. Who would have thought, only a few short months ago, that this room, which he could not escape, would become the only place in existence where he could find some peace? We all imagine we have all our ducks in a row, imagine we know what we could live with, and what we could not, and think we're in control. It only takes one minor adjustment, the slightest thing, a ridiculous detail, to wake us up to the fact we're barely one rung above an eating and breeding machine, programmed to stay alive at any cost. 
Some people find a savage nobility in accepting this thought, in embracing their instinctual nature, they consider it a mark of courage in the struggle for survival they perceive life to be. It clarifies their purpose, removes their internal conflicts, and sets them free from the agony of moral choices, and from the obligation to uphold one's own standards of behavior in the face of insurmountable odds. Tragically for him, he was not one of those people. Even more tragically, he didn't have a martyr bone in his body, and this controlled maze, in which he found himself trapped, didn't look like the hill he wanted to die on. There was no point to it, really, just random iterations of chaos, which seemed both intentional and spontaneously generated, and which would have been interesting enough to entice him to take a closer look, if only they weren't peppered with death threats, absurd details, and pointless punishments. Of course, that was the very nature of chaos, and if one decided to study it, its guiding principles oughtn't surprise one. But chaos doesn't have guiding principles. That is a contradiction in terms, which makes sense once you remember that chaos thrives on the denial of logic. One characteristic of the human spirit, which people only find in their darkest moments, is that it suddenly becomes clear when it finds itself in danger, drenched in uncertainty and sorrow. Then one can see the real reality through its transparent shell. One cannot deny reality going forward, no matter how shockingly it presents itself. I'm a lab rat, his rational mind announced proudly, as if it was some scientific breakthrough worth sharing, some cathartic watershed moment that solved all of his problems, and precluded further research. His soul bounced, embarrassed, between relief and defeat, violently contorted by his overthinking mind, until his weak flesh, still reeling from its recent traumatic experience in ways a strong spirit can't fix, won the fight and set his priorities straight, he had to find something that would help him stay warm. Still shivering, he walked barefoot to the bar, trying to figure out where he was going to find clothes, since the ones he had on were ripped to rags and not weather appropriate. Whenever he needed something, the lounge always seemed to provide, so he went to the kitchen, his heart filled with trust, expecting to find a change of clothes in the dryer, or in one of the open lockers. There weren't any. Idiot, he mumbled to himself. Talking to himself seemed like the reasonable thing to do under the circumstances, his only weapon against his total dissolution as a person. Like Robinson Crusoe on a deserted island, he was beginning to understand that he would have to learn to live in a world with only one inhabitant. How does one adapt to being the only person in their universe? Does one forget to speak after a while? Or stop thinking altogether? To him it seemed quite the opposite. The more the world fractured itself away from his strange boxed existence, the more questions it seemed to raise, deep, philosophical questions he never pondered before. Before what, that was the question, because he couldn't remember his previous life at all, if he ever had one, it was as if he'd been born to this room, fully grown, with no pre-existing thoughts or emotions. Maybe I'm a clone, he thought, not the most ridiculous hypothesis under the circumstances. And if so, what of it? Did that make him less of a person? He shrugged. Nobody gets answers to these questions just for the asking, otherwise the world would have become a much better place a long time ago. There he was, alone, raggedy and cold, holding a drink that didn't yield the expected effect of getting his blood moving. Is it me, or it just got unpleasantly cold in here? Goosebumps on his arms confirmed that the sensation was real, and that alarmed him, because he had figured out by now some of the patterns of this giant lab experiment. If he couldn't find clothes, and the brandy gave him chills, there was no reason to expect that there would be any blankets anywhere, or hot soup, or anything that would help him keep himself warm if the temperature kept dropping. He also understood that the temperature will keep dropping. The obvious solution presented itself, so depressing in light of recent events, that he contemplated death by hypothermia as the better option, but the survival instinct is more powerful than one believes, when one's life is being threatened. He sighed, hating himself more than he ever thought possible, and chose the lesser of evils, the door to the mirrored lounge, in the hope that at least that room would be predictable and warm. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, a choir of male voices, endearingly off-pitch for the extra touch of authenticity, urged him to join in mid-song. Happy birthday, dear Helmuth. Which one is Helmuth, he wondered, not taking himself out of consideration, for obvious reasons. There he is. Always late. Always late, one of the guests wrapped his arm around his shoulder, in an affectionate gesture, but instantly recoiled at the soil on his rags. Good God, what did you get yourself into? Helmuth, he raised his voice to draw the attention of a tall man who was in an excellent mood, compliments of the three glasses of champagne he'd already imbibed. So I'm not Helmuth. Get this guy some clothes, would you? He looks a fright. 
He turned around to face him. Also, a shower wouldn't hurt you. You smell like you spent the night in the cooler. I probably did, he thought. The only question is why. Did you study that proposal I sent you, his new friend asked him, when he returned from the kitchen, with a clean shave, and a well-pressed suit. It felt good to be clean, and the champagne was starting to get to his head, blending the sounds into a soothing background noise. I'm sorry, what? Ah, yeah. Yeah. Needs more research, though. How much more research do you need? We've been running models for six months. I think we covered all the bases, the friend jumped, suddenly offended. I don't know what to say about this. It feels to me like you're not committed to this project. Not knowing how to answer, he stood there in silence, his head bowed so low it touched his chest. Would his answer make any difference? When he inevitably left here, wherever here was, will his decision affect something critical, that had been going on in the life of his alter ego, and if so, was he morally obligated to care? Was it reprehensible, in principle, to make decisions about something he knew nothing about? He could be agreeing to sinking a continent for all he knew. He could be agreeing to save hundreds of people from certain death. There was no way of knowing which, and no end to the moral agony of figuring out the right thing to do in the absence of this knowledge. Well, his friend refused to let him off the hook. Could you flesh out the details for me a bit? I only schemed over the proposal. I've been busy, you know how it is. Oh, so you never read it. That's what I thought. The friend got up with a hurt expression on his face. I thought you were serious about this, and I'm sorry I was wrong. He sat there and watched his friend leave, noticing how his shoulders stretched back in an elastic, quick and subtle motion, which reminded him of tension wire. His only visible reaction to a painful betrayal of trust. He felt suddenly guilty, and ashamed, despite having absolutely no control over this situation, and realized he had just become a jerk without doing anything. There really is no way I could be okay in this environment. No way at all. It is not possible. No matter what he did, it would be wrong. How can one be expected to function in a world in which one is parachuted without being asked, unprepared, and with no time to learn anything about it? If the definition of intelligence is an individual's ability to adapt to new circumstances, he wasn't faring very well right now. He got instantly aggravated by this unfair game, only to collapse in a bout of laughter. Of course it wasn't fair. Fair chaos. That would be the day. His friend threw him a quick glance, startled by the inappropriate laughter, he looked really hurt. I'm a monster, he thought, for no reason. I should have said yes to that proposal, whatever it was. What difference does it make, anyway? He searched for solace at the bottom of his champagne bottle, found it empty and wobbled to the kitchen to get another. This stuff packs a punch, he muttered, in disbelief that he could get so hammered from one glass of bubbly, and he wasn't even surprised when the familiar sound of Muzak welcomed him on the other side of the door. Chapter 7. Duplicate. He wobbled to the nearest chair and sat down, or rather fell in it, if one wanted a more accurate description. He was still holding the champagne bottle in his hand, and did his best to focus on the label, in an attempt to figure out why it had gotten to his head so fast. Focus seemed beyond his current capabilities, so he just noticed the bottle was empty and let it drop to the floor with a hollow noise, which reassured him the fall didn't break it. He leaned back in the chair, trying to make himself as comfortable as possible, and fell asleep immediately, helped by the slowly dimming light. He had no idea how long he'd been sleeping when he woke up, his head pounding, and his mouth feeling like cotton balls. There was a blanket on the chair next to his, neatly folded, so the edges aligned to form a perfect square. Startled by the discovery, he jumped to his feet in a fight-or-flight response that bypassed his brain. There was nobody else in the room, and after he checked inside every cupboard and behind every door, he had the uncomfortable feeling of his privacy having been violated, even as he had no expectation of privacy living in this space. He didn't even know how much time had passed since he first woke up in this lounge, there was no accounting for day or night in this place with no doors, no windows, and no clocks, a place, he had started to suspect, was outside time itself somehow, like some sort of hub where different realities and timelines intersected. His eyes rested on the paneling, with an absent-minded gaze, trying to admire the patterns for their own sake, rather than look for signs of what they could mean, or where they could lead. He was drawn to one of them, far back into a corner, an Art Nouveau pastiche, with intricate flower motifs, and long winding stems. 
He drew near to see it up close, careful not to touch anything, still waiting for whoever brought the blanket to show up unexpectedly from the kitchen and question his presence there. There was no logic to his concern, since his return to this room didn't seem to be any more within his control than his leaving it. Besides, he had gotten used to considering this room his home base, and that made the other person the intruder. Still unstable from his hangover, he accidentally leaned on the panel, fell through the opening, and didn't have a chance to get up before the door snapped closed behind him. Where on earth have you been? His wife from before stood there, watching him with a crease between her eyebrows, in obvious disapproval of his disheveled state and his lack of sobriety. He was still dressed in the tuxedo, but his shirt collar was unbuttoned, and the bow tie hung undone, like a limp butterfly wrapped around his neck. What did one answer to a question like that? What if he told her the truth? The worst that could happen was to get himself some well-deserved rest in a padded room, which promised solitude and quiet, until he walked through a door at random and ended up back in the Muzak lounge. Still hostage to his reason, he decided against it. I'm sorry, he played for time, the boys didn't take no for an answer. They said it would not be more than two hours. Helmuth, are you all right? His wife looked worried. You've been out for five minutes, at most. In fact, I can't understand how you got dressed in such a short time, not to mention end up looking like this, she pointed to his state of undress, appalled. Helmuth, he thought. I'm Helmuth now. The, Helmuth. I look nothing like Helmuth, do I? Suddenly he needed to find a mirror, to see if his face was the same, and while walking to the bathroom, to his wife's increasing distress, he realized he didn't know what he actually looked like, or what his name was, or anything from his real life, if he ever had one. Whatever face he saw in the mirror, it probably looked like Helmuth. Curiosity got the better of him, defying logic, and he locked himself in the bathroom to experience this seminal moment privately, for what it was worth. The face in the mirror didn't tell him anything. No inkling of recognition, no subtle knowledge, but he didn't reject it either, this outer self he was bound to for now. Helmuth, he heard his wife pound on the door, agitated. Open this door right now. He would have liked to spend a little more time alone, to get his bearings, but the insistent pounding on the door intensified. Have you been in a fight? The question welcomed him painfully loud, as he opened the door to the sight of his wife's face uncomfortably close to his own. No, he hesitated. You look it, his wife evaluated his state, to see if she needed to call for help. It was nothing. He had the spontaneous desire to make something up, just to see how far he could stretch the truth before the story collapsed onto itself, for lack of detail and consistency. This thug bounced into me on the street, and I had the unfortunate inspiration to hold him accountable. But you've been drinking, yes, his wife tested his sincerity. Just a glass dear, he admitted sheepishly. A glass of what? You smell like a distillery, his wife protested, unconvinced. The one time I tell the truth, he sighed, defeated. The fake story sounded more believable, so he went back to it. I wish I knew. One of the guys asked me to try this concoction. He said he brought it from somewhere exotic. Worst idea of my life. I feel like a train hit me. You should be more careful, his wife immediately started doting over his righteous indignation, of which she approved. You don't know how it was made. What if it's toxic? You're lucky to get away so easy, you know. I'm sorry, he uttered the universal get out of jail sentence. It seemed to work, and while his wife was still torn between upset and worry, he noticed she was wearing an evening gown. He didn't ask why, but she followed his gaze and extrapolated on its meaning. Do you like it? She turned around so he could see the garment from all angles. Such a beautiful gown, he returned an open-ended comment, hoping to draw out more details. Not that they mattered, anyway. Any moment now, he'd walk through that front door, on his way to wherever they were supposed to be going, and end up back in the lounge. Yes, and so expensive too, she looked guilty about it for a moment, and then her eyes stopped on his clothes, and she went on the offensive instead. You know this tuxedo was rented, right? I can't imagine how we will get it to a state acceptable enough to return it. You certainly can't wear it to the wedding. You look a fright. A wedding, he smiled vaguely, like he was watching a movie with an unexpected twist. I guess I'll just have to find something else to wear then. He got up from the chair, wondering which one of the five doors in the hallway led to the bedroom. Don't even joke about that, his wife stopped him with a decisive gesture. I can't imagine Mrs. Davenport's reaction if you show up in business formal to a black tie event. 
I'd never be able to show my face at the club again. Rent another tuxedo. We will be late, but between two evils, you know, she looked at him, pleased she had found a solution to the problem. If you think so, he agreed. Really, she replied, surprised. That easy. No protests. I just want you to be happy, he uttered get out of jail sentence number two. Of course you do dear, she kissed him on the cheek, purring with contentment. That's why I love you. He got up, without encountering resistance this time, and walked to the front door, while his wife shouted from behind. Since you're going out anyway, can you get bread too? We ran out. He wanted to ask what kind, but then reconsidered, because it sounded like a detail he was supposed to know, and sighed with relief when the door opened to Muzak sounds. He marked the panel with the same sign as the other door leading to that particular reality, and questioned the rationality of trying to make a function out of random associations, that seemed to sprout spontaneously, from a chaotic set of alternate realities constantly in flow, shifting to make his markings irrelevant, even as he was making them. There is no such thing as perfect chaos, he thought, but had to concede that even if he found patterns in this amorphous glob of goo, they would be too few and far between to inform him about its nature.